as we follow event after event when it comes to the revolution in Russia between you know the February Revolution and the October Revolution we've also then moved on to have a look at the subsequent developments uh, of the Bolshevik um, authority and how they established uh, and consolidated Bolshevik authority after the October Revolution. What I want to do now is carry on this this sort of timeline and have a look at the ending of Russian involvement in World War One, something that was uh, looming over uh, Russia for a very long time. So, as an introduction, if we can just, there we go, if we can just do this. So, when Lenin closed down the Constituent Assembly, if you remember, we talked about this in the last video. Okay, so talked about this. Oopsie daisy. We talked about this in the last video. So, if you want to have a refresher go back to that last lesson on the constituent assembly uh, so in the last video when he closed down the constituent assembly a lot of people thought this was generally a bad idea the decision itself was controversial however arguably it wasn't as controversial as the decision to end involvement in world war one now we're going to talk about the reasons for him wanting to end involvement in world war one the motive what then we'll move on to what actually ending involvement in World War One meant for Russia and talk about the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk and then we'll finish by looking at the consequences and the impact and the reactions that a number of the Bolsheviks uh, within his party uh, talked about when it came to the, uh, the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. So first of all, question one, why did Lenin end the war end involvement in World War One. The first one is it was incredibly unpopular. So it effectively led to the February Revolution and it also effectively led to the October Revolution. So as you remember, the February Revolution was sparked, uh, one of the main uh, you know, common factors that sparked the February Revolution was the impact of the war on the economy and on rations and then the, the Tsarist government decided that they were going to announce a, a new bread ration beginning, uh, you know, a couple of weeks before that. And so therefore, people started to march in the street. October Revolution was almost a direct result of the June Offensive and the failure of the June Offensive when the provisional government and the dual power of the provisional government, the sort of the period between February and October, they decided to launch another offensive in World War One that ended disastrously and also led to the October Revolution. Ending the war was essential for the survival of a new government. Don't forget this new, so this uh, this Bolshevik government, this Bolshevik state, was was still very weak, uh, still weak. The strength of the Bolshevik state didn't come about for a very long time, so was still weak. We have we've talked about the fact that they had the um, the the creation of a secret police in the last video, and this is the this was another step towards bringing about a stronger consolidation of the Bolshevik state. Lenin also believed that ending the war would help the economy recover. This is just generally a, a, an objective truth. So objective truth. Objective. I don't know why it's freezing so much. Objective truth. So obviously, wars are expensive. The war, World War One, and Russia's involvement in World War One led to you know a number of um, you know a number of economic uh, mishaps and and economic downfalls. And so, if ending the war was to was to cause economic recovery then the Bolsheviks and Lenin was um, obviously going to support this. And he also knew, Lenin was also uh, predicted that a civil war was going to break out. Okay, He predicted that a civil war and that there would be a struggle for power uh, at some point. A struggle for power. And he was right. There was a civil war, Russian civil war. We'll talk about that in the next couple of videos. Um, and so therefore he wanted there to be as much strength bringing back soldiers to help fight in the civil war he didn't want to be uh, you know on the on an une on an uneven footing almost you know when it came to um, consolidating the bolshevik state and the soviet union 
And then finally we have another reason, and this was because Germany still did have some involvement in Lenin's finances. Okay, so this decision could have been influenced uh, by them. Don't forget Germany wanted Lenin, so, so Germany... So Germany supported Lenin in returning to Russia because he knew they knew that Lenin was going to cause revolution, and you know he was he was a revolutionary. He was going to try and stir up and bring about an end to uh, Russian involvement in World War One. And if Germany had the option to get Russia to just end their conflict with them without Germany having to, you know go and invade and take over then Germany are going to try their best to try and you know send as many revolutionaries into the state as possible and so that's what they did with Lenin and they supported Lenin throughout this okay and so some people suggest that that might have been uh, might have been the decision however I'd argue that Lenin's decision to end involvement in World War One have to be predicated more on the economic and the the, the the ideological promise that Lenin had that he wanted to bring about peace, land and bread. Okay. And he was he went about trying to bring about uh, land and bread in his early reforms and now he wants to bring about peace. Peace with the rest of Europe. So what did the peace negotiations actually look like? So he, Lenin wanted to see peace immediately. Okay. So he wanted to see... Uh, the the quickest ending of the war would see the would have the most dramatic effect so for for the most dramatic effect for most dramatic effect and this is important because if he ends the peace as quickly as possible then you can he's going to bring about you know a, a safer consolidation of of the soviet union and so therefore the armistice was signed on the 2nd of december Lenin appointed Trotsky to conduct peace negotiations with Germany and the German demands were very harsh. So Germany was, had a number of very harsh demands and he they demanded the acquisition of the Baltic state, they wanted areas of Poland, they wanted areas of, of the Ukraine and you know this was a lot of basically a lot of Russia. They wanted a lot of Russia in response if I can, here we go and the consequences of losing these territories would mean that 32% of arable land would have been lost. We would have seen 26% of the Russian railway system being um, acquisitioned, 33% of Russian factories, 75% of Russian coal and iron ore mines, and around 60 million Russian citizens. So you are cutting a huge, huge, huge chunk, uh, a huge chunk of the Russian state and uh, you know acquiring it for 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 the german arm for, for germany and especially this one here uh, this would you know taking away 75 percent of uh, russia's you know natural supplies is going to hamper economic prosperity hamper economic economic prosperity because you know one of the things that a state can rely on when it comes to you know bringing about a greater uh, a greater economy is their natural resources so states tend you know generally when states have uh, you know a high degree of national re natural resources and they have the means to exploit these natural resources they tend to have a better economy than those who don't and they want to get rid of three quarters of the natural resources so, as you can imagine, a number of Bolsheviks massively opposed the peace treaty. For example, uh, Bukharin wanted to fight a revolutionary war into Austria, Hungary and Germany. Um, I think it would be safe to say that uh, Bukharin was a bit of a, del a bit of a delusional. So this was this was a bit delusional. And it really d and it really, you know, failed to grasp and failed to understand the the kind of economic and the military state of the of Russia at the time. Russia would Russia never really succeeded in World War One. They succeeded a little bit at the beginning in a number of uh, key battles, but then as soon as the 
inherent flaws in the in the economy and the military of Russia, of the Russian military began to take shape and take hold as the years went on. Uh, the the German army and the Austro-Hungarian army began to um, you know slowly push them back. So Trotsky thought that a truce should continue without a peace treaty. So they, he just wanted the armistice, but without the without the treaty. Let me just so Trotsky. Trotsky just wanted armistice. I have a feeling this is it's freezing because of battery in my in my special pen, which is quite annoying. Anyway, so Trotsky thought the truce would come out of peace treaty. Yeah, he wanted he wanted armistice, so he wanted just armistice. Just armistice. This is not me being terrible at writing, by the way. This is the um, the pen that is just deciding to run out of battery right now. Anyway, so we have the different oppositions to the treaty. You've got Bukharin on one very extreme side of the table saying that you know we should just carry on fighting and, and win the war, which would be silly. And then you've got the Bol other Bolsheviks, people like Trotsky, saying that while he wanted a peace treaty, he wanted a peace treaty, it wasn't worth the, the cost that Germany was imposing on Russia. And so therefore, just have a armistice without any kind of treaty. Obviously, Germany were going to try to incur these kinds of, um, you know, very harsh concessions from Russia because they were negotiating from a position of strength. The, the, they knew that the Russian state wasn't going to survive. They knew that the Soviet Union was never going to take shape if Lenin had to fight a war against Austro-Hungary and, and the German Empire, as well as a civil war between the Whites and the Reds, then you know this is something that wasn't going to go well. So they were negotiating from a position of strength. And Lenin knew that unless he signed a peace treaty, unless a treaty was signed, um, the civil uh, this this inevitable civil war would would possibly end in a, end disastrously for him so lenin threatened to resign unless the bolsheviks supported it so and you know he effectively did a bit of a tantrum to get his way so tan i'm going i'm going to write that tantrum uh, to get his way to get his own way so this actually did work. It got the support of the Bolsheviks to support the treaty. And on the 3rd of March 1918, uh, Trotsky signed the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, which was a very harsh treaty against the uh, against the Soviet Union. And it was an extremely controversial and unpopular move uh, for Lenin. And the support in his party declined massively. However, it must be said that this this can be seen as an initial reaction. So this can be seen as an initial reaction because even though it was very, very unpopular, it was probably the right thing to do, okay? Because of these reasons up here. Don't forget that the war itself was incredibly unpopular and that the economy would recover in a situation where it's not fighting a war, okay? And it would recover as well in a situation where it wasn't fighting a war and a civil war. So eventually, the benefits of peace would eventually outweigh the damage that was done to the uh, to the economy and to the state itself in terms of, uh, you know, losing the Baltic states. So if we have a look up here, this is a map of Europe in 1919. So before the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, the uh, I'm gonna try my best to outline it so we have the baltic states around here okay what else did they want they wanted bits of poland i believe uh yeah areas of poland so we have the baltic states we go right around here take around ukraine okay we have austria hungary around here and we go up i i, I got a, lot, a few comments in the last video or a, a very early video where i just took a picture of the Russian state and just drew a big circle around it and I accidentally circled bits of Serbia which obviously wasn't part of the Russian state but what the German army wanted effectively if we were to take it I take a red color here if it loads okay they wanted these Baltic states okay they wanted parts of Poland and they wanted Ukraine so we are seeing a huge 
take parts of Poland. We're seeing a huge, okay, uh, amount of of the Russian state uh, being split up. Okay, this is a very rough drawing, by the way. If if people comment saying that, you know, this <laughs> I wasn't accurate enough, then I'm very sorry. Don't forget as well, if I'm just on you know, on a tangent, just don't forget as well, when uh, the Treaty of Versailles was eventually signed, uh, Poland was eventually uh, taken and was said to be a free a free state uh, and was established. So, you know, the in incursion did l take Russia all the way back down here. Okay. And if there's one thing that's very interesting is that um, you can understand... Russian foreign policy as early as Ivan the Terrible and probably even earlier than that Ivan the Terrible were uh, who died in um, 1547 Ivan the Fourth even before that or even as early as Vladimir the Third you can understand their foreign policy in terms of wanting uh, access to this sea here and these trade routes because without access to these trade routes the Russian state was uh, cut off completely um, in the winter because up here the uh, you know the supply lines would freeze over. So this is a number of reasons why uh, wars with Poland and stuff and and then the Baltic states there was a lot of conflicts, things like the Livonian Wars um, and things like wars under uh, Mikhail the first of uh, the first of the Romanov dynasty and of even Peter the Great in 1725. So you know. That was just as a tangent, you know, that you can explain Russian foreign policy quite well by whether or not they have access to this trade route and these, uh, you know, access to the Atlantic here. Anyway, back to back to what we were talking about. So the treaty was unpopular. The treaty was uh, it lost a lot of support for Lenin. However, there was, you know, a, a silver lining in all this and that it did eventually make the Bolshevik Party stronger against uh, when it came to the civil war. So that's what we're going to talk about in the next few videos. I know I've been saying that in every video, but we have to we have to put into place these key events that took place. So things like the ending of the war, things like the abolishing of the Constituent Assembly. And in the next few videos, we're going to explain and go into plenty of detail about the Russian Civil War itself.